Essays on Clive and Hastings, Macaulay. Introduction. Life of Macaulay, 1800 to 1859. Probably no writer in any language has given so much historical and literary information and misinformation in so entertaining a style to so many persons as Thomas Babington Macaulay. He had a positive passion for facts. Nevertheless, in his 34 years as a writer, he exhibited such an interesting and brilliant antithetical style that he sometimes gave misinformation, unconsciously, in his desire to say something strong and entertainingly. Very likely, he gathered more information before he was 25 years old than he did in the last 34 years. At any rate, it proves convenient in studying the events of his busy, happy, and mostly prosperous life to consider them in two periods. The period of preparation from 1800 to 1825 and the period of productiveness from 1825 to 1859. During the second half of the second period, he wrote his essays on Clive and Hastings, reviews of the lives of men prominent in Indian affairs. Macaulay's youth was singularly fortunate. His father, Zachary Macaulay, was of good Scotch descent. He is buried in Westminster, along with several other noted English advocates of the abolition of slavery. Except for Macaulay, there is scarcely an Englishman of fame buried in Westminster, whose father is also buried there. The place of Thomas B. Macaulay's birth was Rothley Temple, Leicestershire, England. He was the eldest of eight children. In 1803, the family moved to Clapham, near London, where they continued to reside for 18 years. Tom's mother thought he was a wonderful child. But in spite of his superior powers of language, she would not permit people to tell him he was unusually bright for one so young. When only three, he enjoyed reading serious books or sitting by the fire conversing with his elders. When only four, he had a copious vocabulary. A cup of coffee was spilled on him one day. Solicitously, the hostess inquired whether it hurt. He replied, Thank you, madame. The agony is abated. Tom would often listen, with the consent of his father, to the talk that went on in the Macaulay home when prominent members of Parliament and abolitionists met to discuss ways of advancing the cause of abolition of slavery in the West Indies. As a mere boy, Tom wrote an article, which he desired should be translated into an Indian dialect, so as to persuade the people of Travancore to embrace the Christian religion. By the time he was twelve, he had memorized a large part of Scott's Lay of the Last Minstrel, and Marmion, Milton's Paradise Lost, and Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, besides a good deal of the Bible, for which he had a wonderful knack of taking in pages at a glance and remembering the contents and the very language for all time. A letter written by him at the age of 13 shows better than anything else the kind of boy he was, and by implication, the kind of parents he had. Shelford, August 14th, 1813. My dear Mama, I must confess that I have been a little disappointed at not receiving a letter from home today. I hope, however, for one tomorrow. My spirits are far more depressed by leaving home than they were last half year. Everything brings home to my re recollection. Everything I read or see or hear brings it to my mind. You told me I should be happy when I once came here, but not an hour passes in which I do not shed tears at thinking of home. Every hope, however unlikely to be realized, affords me some small consolation. The morning on which I went, you told me that possibly I might come home before the holidays. If you can confirm that hope, believe me when I assure you there is nothing which I would not give for one instant sight of home. Tell me in your next, expressly if you can, whether or no there is any likelihood of my coming home before the holidays. If I could gain Papa's leave, I should select my birthday, October 25th, as the time which I should wish to spend at that home which absence renders still dearer to me. I think I see you sitting by Papa just after his dinner, reading my letter and turning to him with an inquisitive glance at the end of the paragraph. I think, too, that I see his expressive shake of the head at it. Oh, may I be mistaken. You cannot conceive what an alteration a favorable answer would produce on me. If your approbation of my request depends upon my advancing in study, I will work like a cart horse. If you should refuse it, you will deprive me of the most pleasing illusion which I ever experienced in my life. Pray do not fail to write speedily. Your dutiful and affectionate son. T.B. Macaulay. 
After attendance at private school, he entered Trinity College, Cambridge University in 1818. Here he was a brilliant scholar and debater, averse only to the study of mathematics. He won prizes for Latin declamation and for two English poems, Pompeii in 1819 and Evening, 1821. The family moved to London in 1821. That year, Macaulay won a scholarship at the university. In 1822, he received the bachelor's degree. In 1823, it became his good fortune to have to do something for his family. He took private pupils to make up as far as he could. He was made fellow of Trinity in 1824. While he was at college, he wrote The Battle of Ivory and other ballads for Knight's Quarterly Magazine, which was circulated mostly at Cambridge and Eton. At the age of 25, he took the master's degree. Now, having been remarkably industrious during his youth, he had richer stores of information than most persons have at the end of their lives. The years when Macaulay made for himself a career in literature and in politics were, in spite of one or two trying situations, as prosperous and active as could well be imagined. No attempt, however, will be made to do more than relate, in strict chronological order, the principal definite events of his public literary and political career. It is strongly urged that the student find for himself more about these years in one of the most readable biographies ever written, The Life and Letters of Lord Macaulay, by his nephew, George Otto Trevelyan. The same year in which Macaulay received the master's degree from Cambridge, he wrote the famous essay on Milton, the second of a series of 40 essays that he contributed to the Edinburgh Review in the years from January 1825 to October 1844. At the age of 26, he became a barrister in Lincoln's Inn, London. Caring more for politics and literature than for law, he spent more time listening to speeches in the House of Commons, making Whig speeches at political meetings, and writing for the magazines than he spent in the practice of the law. Through the aid of a political opponent, Lord Lyndhurst, he became commissioner in bankruptcy in 1828. Two years later, through the assistance of Lord Lansdowne, who had been greatly interested by the essay on Mill, Macaulay became a member of Parliament for Calney. His reform bill speeches, though uttered in a rapid, somewhat monotonous delivery, gained for him a reputation for eloquence, and when printed, were found to be convincing in thought. The literary and political celebrities, whether belonging to his own party, the Whigs, or to the opposing party, praised the vigorous new member. Yet when his commissionership and his college fellowship both came to an end in 1832, he had to pawn his college gold medals, now, notwithstanding his very considerable and growing reputation. It is said that at this time he scarcely knew where to turn for a morsel of bread. However, the financial trouble soon passed away, for he was made a commissioner of the Board of Control of Indian Affairs, and a year later became secretary of the board. In Parliament, he was now representing the manufacturing city of Leeds. His speech in 1833 on the bill for the renewal of the charter of the East India Company was considered a remarkable effort. In February 1834, he sailed for India at a salary of £10,000 a year, for five years as law member of the Supreme Council of India. One reason why he consented to go to India was that, though he had no desire whatever for riches, he did wish a reasonable income for life, and the Indian position promised him such an income if he would be careful to save from his large salary. His greatest work for the distant empire was done as president of a commission for composing a criminal code for India. This code was published in 1837, but did not become law until 1860. Another Indian service of permanent value was his work as president of a committee which founded the educational system of India. He returned to England in 1838. Soon after his return, he was on the point of fighting a duel with a man whose book he had mercilessly criticized in the Edinburgh Review. But the duel was averted by friends of the parties. In the autumn of 1838, he traveled in Italy. In March 1839, he began his History of England, which is more fascinating than most novels. Macaulay read thousands of novels. He did not accomplish much at first on the history, because the people of Edinburgh 
invited him to stand for a seat in Parliament as their representative. He was elected in 1839 and continued to represent Edinburgh for eight years. Soon after his election, he became Secretary of War, holding the position for two years. His essay on Clive appeared in the Edinburgh Review in January 1840 and his Hastings in October 1841. In 1842, he was instrumental on, in the passage of a copyright law given to authors sole ownership of their writings for 42 years after publication. His, he published his Lays of Ancient Rome in 1842. The next year, since publishers were bringing out his essays without paying him anything for them, he felt obliged to publish a complete copyrighted edition. He became Paymaster General in 1846. The following year, because of his active su support of the Toleration Acts and his general air of independence, he lost his Edinburgh seat in the House and retired from political life to finish his History of England. Volumes 1 and 2 of the History appeared in 1848. Their author was installed Lord Rector of Glasgow University in 1849. He declined a Cambridge professorship of modern history and a cabinet position. In 1852, owing to the tremendous amount of work that he had done in so short a time, his health broke down. But he was that year urged to represent Edinburgh again in Parliament and did so. His last speech in the House was made in July 1853. He prepared civil service rules and examinations for India in 1854. He published volumes three and four of his history in 1855 receiving in the next year 20,000 pounds in royalties. For his articles on Goldsmith and Johnson, contributed in 1856 to the Encyclopedia Britannica, he refused any payment, saying that these were labors of love and that he needed for his own wants, he having never married, no more money than he had. On account of ill health, he gave up his seat in Parliament in 1856. Now, when he was nearing the end of his life, he took up his residence in Holly Lodge, near Kensington Palace, London. In 1857, he was made Baron Macaulay of Rothley, but rarely took his seat in the House of Lords. That year, too, he was made High Steward of the Borough of Cambridge. He kept working on his history till his death, December 28, 1859, at Holly Lodge. He was buried in the Poet's Corner in Westminster Abbey. In looking back over this biography, a reader cannot fail to be astonished at the immense amount of work that Macaulay was able to do. His literary activity is, as the greatest essayist of his time in his particular field of biography, and as the most popular writer after Scott, would alone seem to be enough for a busy life and of an extraordinary man. His work in Parliament as a speaker of unquestioned oratorical power and keen intellectual grasp of great questions would alone make enough activity for all but the most exceptional members. His constructive, permanently effective work in advancing important reforms in India and in England would fill up more than three score years of activity for most men. But Macaulay carried on all these lines of activity without seeming to be worried by any of them and had time besides for social life as a splendid talker in the homes of the wits of the age and as an affectionate uncle in his sister's home. There is no English writer who stands in the same class with Macaulay as the embodiment of energy. No writer compares with him in the practical accomplishment of the things that his keen, restless mind set before him to accomplish. The keynote of his life was hard work with a cheerful outlook. Only his history remains incomplete. Questions. 1. What have you learned in this book or elsewhere regarding the domestic life of Macaulay? 2. What do you consider to be the use of knowing anything about the life of an author whose book you have read or are reading? 3. What did the world do for Macaulay? 4. What did he do for the world? 5. What kind of preparation did he have for his life work? 6. What official positions did he hold? 7. What kinds of writing did he do? 8. What writings of his have you read? Why have you read so many? Why have you not read more? 9. In exactly 100 words, write a biography of Macaulay. Imagine that you are spending a certain amount of money, words, 
and see how you can spend your money to get the best returns for it. If you look at such a task as this in the right light, you will soon come to see the value of words and the necessity for proportion. 10. From Macaulay's schoolboy letter to his mother, what can you infer concerning the temper and character of his parents? Object of the reading. The essays on Clive and Hastings are to be read not as history, but as literature. This makes a great deal of difference to the student approaching the reading of the two essays for the first time. Bewilderment will be the state of the ordinary reader who plunges into even the first paragraph of Clive with the idea of understanding offhand every obscure historical allusion that cannot be hoped for from school readers of today. Not every schoolboy does know the things that Macaulay thinks the schoolboy knows. In the matter of the history presented in these two essays, the best that the average reader can do is to get a fairly good grip on the essential facts in the career of Robert Clive, which made him recognized by historians as the British Empire builder in India, and of the essential facts in the career of Warren Hastings, which made him the great administrator of Indian affairs. If, besides the obvious large facts in the lives of these two men, the reader can understand some of the picturesque details and something of the general historical events involved. He may consider that he has enough of the information in the case to go on with the main purpose of the reading, which is to secure a grip on the method of literary presentation of historical facts as illustrated by Macaulay. Macaulay does not aim so much to instruct as to interest and entertain. It is his way of writing, with which the reader of the essays in a course of literature is most concerned. The pupil then need not feel discouraged if parts of the essays make him sleepy. It might be a good idea first to hurry through the essays, skimming the cream of lively narrative, like Clive's defense of Arcot and his contest for a seat in Parliament. It would be advisable after such a hurried glance through the pages to take a second look a little more carefully. The first view would show the most interesting narrative parts. The second would make the main divisions clear and would take in as many details as it might seem advisable to try to absorb in the time at the disposal of the reader. A final general view would clinch the main facts in the careers of the two Englishmen most concerned in the evolution of English control of India and would give a final impression of the author's characteristic manner of writing as illustrated in these essays. Place of the Essays in the History of English Literature The Clive and Hastings represent Macaulay's historical as opposed to his literary essays. By common consent, Macaulay is rec recognized as having done better work in his historical than in his literary essays, for though he had an eye for the picturesque and could tell graphically the outward events of a man's life or of a national epoch, he lacked the subtlety of understanding and fineness of feeling necessary to supreme success in discussing the essence of a spiritually minded man's writings or in penetrating to the core of a period of national literature. Yet because of this very limitation of his, he was able better to please his contemporaries than any other non-imaginative writer of the time. His series of fascinating review articles made an era in the history of literature. It was this series that alone was able to rival in popularity in the Victorian age the immense output of novels produced by Eliot, Dickens, and Thackeray, to mention only a few of the popular novelists of the time. Macaulay's essays, particularly his historical essays, put human interest consistently to the front. Macaulay and the contemporary writers of essays, Carlyle, for instance, thought that history should deal with human beings of passions, caprices, moods, loves, and hates, dwelling in a world of interesting costumes, arms, architecture, ideas, and beliefs. Lang. Consequently, the historical writing of these men, whether in the form of long histories or shorter essays, was as in entertaining as instructive. It was literature because it was done with art and imbued with a powerful personality. The historical essays of Macaulay belong, then, in the front rank, of the entertaining and instructive essays produced in the early Victorian age of English literature. Sketch of the Life of Lord Clive Sir William Hunter, in A Brief History of Indian Peoples, strikingly characterizes the work of Lord Clive by saying 
that from Clive's victory at Plassey dates the English supremacy in India, and from his second administration as governor date the English efforts at good government in India. This authoritative view of the achievements of Clive corresponds well with the estimate in Macaulay's essay. In fact, the essay of Macaulay is to be trusted in the main as giving a fair and accurate account of the life of Clive. Yet, since Macaulay inserts few dates, a succinct narrative of the principal events of Lord Clive's life may assist the reader to follow the essay. Robert Clive, born September 29, 1725, near Market Drayton in Shropshire, England, was the eldest of the 13 children of an impoverished country squire. In school, he was constantly in trouble because of his high temper and mischievous spirit. In 1743, he was offered a clerkship in the East India Service. The next year, after an unusually long voyage, during which he learned Portuguese, he reached Madras penniless. Having small pay and no friends, he soon, he soon tried to kill himself. In 1746, he was taken prisoner by Labour Donnes, but escaped to Fort St. David. Entering the military service as ensign in 1747, he next year distinguished himself by his bravery at the un unsuccessful siege of Pondicherry. He became lieutenant under Major Stringer Lawrence. Then he was promoted to be commissariat officer. He was twice in charge of reinforcements sent to Trichinopoly and in 1750 became captain in charge of several hundred men. He captured Arcot, capital of the Carnatic, in 1751. Then, with only 80 European soldiers and fewer than 200 native soldiers, he successfully defended Arcot while he was besieged by 7,000 troops from September 23rd to November 14th, 1751. Taking the offensive, he now defeated the French and natives in several engagements and helped Major Lawrence capture Trichinopoly. He married in 1752 Margaret Maskeline. In poor health, he returned to England 1753. There he paid his father's debts and was elected to Parliament, but was not seated. In 1755, he was again in Bombay, having now been appointed Lieutenant Colonel. He captured the pirate stronghold Jeraya in 1756. He took charge of Fort St. David just before the Calcutta Black Hole Massacre and set out at once to avenge the atrocity. He captured Calcutta in 1757, forcing the native ruler responsible for the massacre, Surajah Daula, Nabob of Bengal, to sue for peace. Next, he captured Chandernagore when he discovered treacherous intentions in the Nabob. He abetted a conspiracy by which the Nabob's general, Mir Jafir, was to become Nabob. Amichund, a Hindu go-between, who threatened to betray the conspiracy, Clive tricked by means of two treaties, one genuine, the other false. Thus gaining time, he thoroughly defeated the Nabob at the Battle of Plassey, June 1757. After this, he made Mir Jafir Nabob, who soon permitted Sarajah Daula to be put to death. From Mir Jafir, Clive accepted a large present and the quetrant of the company's territory. As soon as the news of the victory of Plassey reached the directors, they made Clive governor of Bengal, 1758. In 1759, he defeated a Dutch armament that entered the Hooghly to find a rival colony. He returned to England in 1760. A rich man, he was promptly raised to the Irish peerage as Lord Clive, Baron of Plassey. In 1764, he was chosen Knight of the Bath. Great abuses have arisen in the in Indian administration. Lord Clive was sent out to make reforms. He reached Bengal as governor for the second time, May 1765. His reforms in both the civil and the military service were far-reaching and drastic. By pensioning the Nabob of Bengal, he secured to the company the supreme power in the province. Out of a legacy from Mir Jafir, he established a fund for invalid officers of the company. 
With health gone, he returned to England in 1767. There was a parliamentary inquiry into his acts 1772 to 1773, marked by much bitterness, but ending only in a gentle censure. Though honored by being installed as Knight of the Bath and Lord Lieutenant of Shropshire, Clive became sick and gloomy, a victim of opium. He committed suicide November 1774. The best accounts of his life and services to England will be found in the following books, at least one of which may be accessible to the reader who desires more detailed information. Malcolm, Life of Robert Lord Clive, three volumes, London, 1836. The book on which Macaulay based his review article. Mallison, Founders of the Indian Empire, Lord Clive, London, 1882. Mill, History of British India, Volume 3. Orm, History of the Military Transactions of the British Nation in Indistan from the year 1745, London, 1803. Sketch of the Life of Warren Hastings. In Sitchell's biography of Richard B. Sheridan, published in 1909, this summarizing sentence follows a long discussion of the speeches which Sheridan made against Hastings during the impeachment trial. Warren Hastings was a pioneer of empire, a great ruling Englishman, and he did his duty according to his lights. It is worthwhile to try to sift out the conflicting statements concerning the deeds of this great pioneer of empire and see in brief just what he did during his long life. Born in Oxfordshire, December 6th, 1732, he lived in, as a child with his grandfather in the rectory of Dalesford House near Adelstrop, a few miles northwest of Oxford. His father's eldest brother, Howard, sent him to school in 1740 to, Newting, to Newington Butts and in 1742 to Westminster School. Here he stood first in, in a competition for a scholarship. Elijah Impey standing three places below him, and here he continued his studies till 1748. At the death of his uncle, he was sent to a private tutor's to prepare for the East Indian Civil Service. In October 1750, he arrived at Calcutta. Serving in Calcutta as a clerk for the company, he was promoted to be its representative at Kosim Bazaar. Here he, took it, here he was taken prisoner by the Nabob of Bengal and sent to Moors Shed Abad. His ability to speak the Persian and Hindustani languages was a valuable aid to him at this time in his negotiations with native princes. In 1757, he served as a soldier with Clive. He was agent for the company at Moor Shed Abad, 1757 to 1760, and member of the council at Calcutta, 1761 to 1764. He was dispatched on an important mission to Patna in 1762. Moderately rich, he returned to England in 1764. By the evidence he gave on Indian Affairs 1766, before a par parliamentary committee, he made something of a stir in England. During his visit to his native land, he wasted his money. In 1769, he returned to India as second in council at Madras. On the voyage out, he fell in love with Baroness Imha. He became governor of Bengal in 1772. With residence at Calcutta, his chief work at this time was the change he accomplished in the financial and judicial system of Bengal, Bihar, and Orissa, bringing these provinces closely under the direction of the company. In 1773, in accordance with a treaty made nine years before, he assisted Suja Daula, Nabob of Oud, against the Rohilas. He largely suppressed wandering bands of robbers. The Regulating Act of 1773 made Hastings Governor General. As such, he was opposed by a majority of the council, but in the end, he always had his way. He was accused by Nunkumar of having taken a bribe. He in turn accused Nunkumar of conspiracy and sent a conditional resignation to the company. Before the case of Nunkumar was taken up, that high caste Brahmin was hanged for forge forgery in 1775 on a charge brought by an obscure native 
the case being decided by Supreme Court Justice Elijah Impey. Hastings sold the privilege of the opium trade for a term of years and thus increased the public revenues. Having the support of the Supreme Court, 1777, he continued as governor in spite of the acceptance in London of his tentatively offered resignation. He was soon vindicated by the Court of Proprietors. He married the Baroness Imhoff, whose reputation Macaulay unjustly slurs. He checked the rising power of the Marathas. In a duel of 1780, he wounded Francis and thus became untrammeled by the bitter opposition of this fellow member of the council. He drove Hyder Ali from the Carnatic and attacked the French settlements. He heavily fined Cheta Singh of Banaras in 1781. He is charged with having been a party to the imprisonment of the Begums of Oud and with having mercilessly stripped them of their land and wealth. He founded the, the Learned Asiatic Society, 1784, and returned to England, 1785. Triumphant in nearly every act of his in India, he was buffeted about in England for the next 10 years. The House of Commons passed a vote of censure, 1786, for his fining Chaiti Singh so heavily. He was impeached, 1787, on the charge of corruption and cruelty in his Indian administration. The trial lasted from 1788 to 1795. Though he was acquitted, he had to spend £70,000 on the conduct of his defense. This sum was made up to him, however, by the company. He lived in retirement at Dalesford, 1795 to 1818, receiving a few home honors in his old age, membership in the Privy Council, a doctor's degree from Oxford, public presentation to the Allied Sovereigns by the Prince Regent in London, and respectful reception by the House of Commons, standing with bared heads. He died in 1818 and is honored by a bust in Westminster Abbey. The reader who desires further to pursue the subject of the life and administrations of Hastings will find it advisable to consult some or all of the books named below. Lyell, Warren Hastings, London, 1889, the most satisfactory book yet written in this field. Mallison, Life of Warren Hastings, London, 1894, a more detailed book than Lyell's, but impressing one is not impartial. Trotter, Warren Hastings, London, 1878. Lawson, Private Life of Warren Hastings, London, 1895, made interesting by its many pictures. Gleig, Memories of the Life of Warren Hastings, three volumes, London, 1841. The book which Macaulay took as an excuse for his essay. Strachey, Hastings and the Rohilla War, Oxford, 1892, in which it is shown that, contrary to Macaulay's assertions, Hastings did not sell the Rohilas to the Nabob of Oud merely to enrich the company, and that he did not tolerate nor permit undue violence against the Rohilas by the Nabob. Stephen, the story of Nuncomar and impeachment of Sir Elijah Impey, which authoritatively and finally disproves the story of the judicial murder of Nuncomar by Hastings and Impey. Stephen shows that the accusation of corruption brought by Nuncomar against Hastings had no validity, but the charge brought by a certain Indian lawyer of the forging of a bond by Nuncomar was sustained not by Impey alone, but by a full vote of the Supreme Court, that Hastings is absolutely cleared of having maliciously framed an accusation against Nuncomar for the purpose of silencing him, and that Impey's part in the trial of Nuncomar was that of a fair and upright judge. A book confirming the conclusions just mentioned and going even further in defense of Hastings is G. W. Hastings, A Vindication of Warren Hastings, London, 1909. Lastly, a valuable book containing documentary evidence on the subject of Hastings' acts is Forrest's Administration of Warren Hastings, 1772-1785. Calcutta, 1892.